So good morning, and uh, thanks for coming. My name is Tam Hunt. Um, I'm at UCSB. I'm a scholar in the psychology department there. And um, I have a book of essays out, if you're curious to check it out after the talk, called Eco Ego Eros. It's all about essentially the mind-body problem and um, reconciling science and spirituality. And that's really my topic today, um, which is an abbreviated version. All right, so the title is Cause, Effect, and the Nature of Mind. And what I'm looking at really here is how do we reach a better reconciliation of today's science and our experience of being conscious, awake beings, being human. And I'm curious, I'm um, taking a cue from Teresa here, a little Q&A in the beginning. What are some ways in which the current materialist paradigm fails to explain human experience? I mean, there's a lot of them, but give me some examples. Sure. Anyone else? Can you repeat the answer of the uh, He said the explanatory gap, kind of the mind-body problem, essentially. Well, there's three that I focus on here. And essentially, um, materialism, for you know, the shorthand version of today's scientific paradigm, um, has a hard time explaining um, experience itself. Um, if the world is merely matter and energy moving in space and time, how does awareness, consciousness, crop up in a naturalistic kind of way? That's not simply a miracle that, oh, now it pops up in humans at some point in their history. It's a real kind of, um, like I said, the explanatory gap is very real in that way. Um, we also have difficulty in explaining the flow of time. And the flow of time is, for each of us, very real. Now, 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 now. It's part and parcel of being aware, of being conscious. And in modern physics today, the flow of time is basically denied. It's called an illusion. And to me, um, it's a very real illusion. At the very least, we have to figure out why it feels so real that there is, in fact, a now, 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 and now. We only know the now. And last, uh, maybe most importantly, is a feeling of free will, of being free agents in our lives, more or less. Of course, we don't have ultimate free will. We have history that informs our actions and in some ways does compel certain choices. What we certainly feel is that we are free. I move my arm up and down right now. I'm choosing to do that. And again, modern science, the current version of modern science, says that feeling is also an illusion. And I'll explain why here. So it's called cause, effect, and the nature of mind because really what I've been trying to do in my work the last few years is kind of drill down on why modern science has such a hard time explaining these phenomena. And essentially, um, words ultimately are choices, and they're pointers, but they help in clarifying certain problems and certain solutions. So here I use cause and effect because I've, I feel essentially matter, energy, mind, free will, nature of time, kind of boil down to an inquiry into what is cause and effect. So my version of what that is, is something here causes something there. I lift the book up. That's a very simple example of cause and effect. More generally, this universe is nothing but a web of cause and effect, of stuff here causing things here. And again, this may be some kind of illusion, but it certainly is an illusion of things happening here causing things here. How do you explain that process? And how does it relate to our feeling of being agents in our own lives, of being free agents in our own lives. And um, the current version of um, materialist science says essentially we can reduce these phenomena of cause and effect to the microphysical. That essentially the real action, the real work in the universe is being done at the microphysical, the level of atoms. Everything beyond that level is essentially built upon that lower level. And when you get to the point of humans, a fairly high level of reality in terms of the many levels to reality, we feel as though we are free in our lives. 
But in fact, that is completely an illusion because real action, again, is taking place at the level of atoms. So when you go back in that chain of reasoning to the Big Bang, the current worldview, essentially everything was set in motion at the moment of the Big Bang. Literally everything. We are fully determined in every way from the very moment of conception of our current reality. And of course, that very much goes against our feeling as human beings and our feeling of being free agents in our lives. So again, even if there is some level of real illusion going on there, we need to figure out why it's such a compelling illusion. Sorry, my computer shut down here. And by the way, feel free to ask questions as we go. I like a dialogue rather than me just talking at you. So essentially what this does, um, this deterministic, materialistic paradigm, it reduces us to bystanders. And the term for this is epiphenomenalism. And so essentially we are in the current prevailing paradigm among the you know, intelligentsia, uh, bystanders in our own lives. And again, that very much contradicts our feeling as humans, as free agents in our lives. So what I'm trying to get at here in this talk is how do we reconcile those feelings with physical reality, our understanding of physical reality. So one way to do this is to look at causation differently. Rather than this reductionist causation model, uh, we can look to causation as being radial. So the term I'm using nowadays is radial causation. And essentially radial causation says that all things actually have causal power all processes have causal power to be, more, to be more accurate here. And it's not that there is an ultimate level upon which all things are built. Every level has causal power. Downward, upward, all around, as the term radial suggests. So essentially, this process of entities coming into being in each moment is a process of cause and effect, both being impacted by prior entities and then becoming a causal entity yourself as either a human being or an electron or what have you. All entities are processes that both are impacted and then impact other entities in the next iteration of the ongoing cycle. And what you get in this uh, notion of reality is not a parallel system of cause and effect on physical reality. Physical reality is nothing but a web of cause and effect. That's what it is. And then figuring out how that process unfolds in each entity, in each node on the web, is then a way to get to a more accurate notion of cause and effect in physical reality. So, you know, this is kind of the Newtonian model, right? We're all cogs in a machine. Reality is nothing but cogs in a machine. Everything works through friction, direct action. And of course, our modern paradigm has moved beyond that very simple uh, notion of reality, and of course the theme of entanglement uh, is all about how modern physics, quantum physics, essentially has changed that paradigm. But there still is, as we've heard you know, in a few talks this week so far, um, a failure to internalize that reality from modern physics. And so even though I think most people here in the conference would agree that quantum mechanics has a lot to be figured out still, it certainly has, is hinting at a different kind of reality. And the paradigm I'm, I'm sketching today certainly is consonant with the empirical data of quantum mechanics. So what I'm trying to do here is basically bridge the world of mainstream science with, again, our feeling of being human, having consciousness, having free will, et cetera. So the alternative worldview that you can get through a notion of radial causation is more web-like. So Indra's net is a nice paradigm in uh, some, forms, some forms of Buddhism. And um, this image is really cool. Actually, Cassie Veaton showed the same image. And um, essentially, the, the web of jewels shows both you know, the connections between all entities and processes, but also the fact that each of those little dew drops as jewels reflects the entirety in some manner. And I am agnostic right now as to whether that drop reflects the entirety, as in Huayan Buddhism, for example, or only reflects the neighborhood around it. 
But either way, it's certainly an expansion of that cog-like paradigm, uh, which is still fairly pervasive in most people's minds. So what I'm sketching here is kind of inspired by a school of thought called process philosophy. And this is a Western school of thought. Um, it goes back to Heraclitus in Greece. Um, and Leibniz was you know, certainly part of this uh, school of thought. Uh, in the modern era, Alfred North Whitehead was the most um, famous proponent. And he was a mathematician, philosopher, logician, uh, British guy, was at Harvard for about 20 years at the end of his career and wrote a ton of very interesting and difficult books. I would not recommend reading his books directly as, a, as an introduction, um, but a really good book to actually figure out uh, how to enter into his world is called Unsnarling the World Knot by David Ray Griffin. And it kind of inspired me to really kind of make an effort to understand his work. And essentially um, what his thinking gets at is how do we reconcile notions of physical reality and modern science with the experience of being human. And so essentially he's getting at the link between the objective and the subjective realm. And the term you might have heard um, in recent years is panpsychism. So certainly this is a type of panpsychism because matter and mind are in this philosophy two sides of the same coin. And um, this relates to kind of the spiritual traditions in the East in many ways. Whitehead himself did not delve into those commonalities, but others have. And there's certainly many commonalities between uh, Buddhism and Vedanta, Shaivism, etc. And for Whitehead, creativity with a capital C was the ultimate reality. And again, these words don't really matter too much, but they really get to, there, there is a deeper level of reality than this manifest reality. In my opinion, it doesn't mean this reality we're in now is an illusion by any means, but it certainly may not be the only reality, and I don't think it is. I think there is a deeper reality that kind of leads to this reality bubbling up out of that deeper reality. Now, time is really key to process philosophy because this process I'm talking about of perpetual creative unfolding, of course, requires time. Unfolding, change, etc. Creativity itself requires time. You have to have something happening. And that's what time is. So we've heard in the conference this year uh, many statements about being beyond space and time. And this, I think, is a very deep and tricky debate. And I think it's a matter of semantics more than real disagreement. Personally, I think all stuff, all even potentiality, exists in a container of time. But time becomes manifest, becomes apparent, only when you have actuality. Because to actually realize this change going on, you have to have stuff. So when you get to a deeper level of reality, of pure creativity, pure potentiality, it is as if there is no time because there is nothing really going on. It's just pure humming beingness bliss. When you get up to higher levels of reality, then time manifests more overtly. So this notion is known as presentism. And certainly, I think most people here would, would accept and agree with the idea that we have only the now accessible to us in a very real way. The past is pure memory. The future is pure imagination. The now is here. Now getting to the idea of free will. So first, let me take a little poll. Who here feels as though they are free beings? Only three or four hands? H halfway free. Halfway free? One third free? <laughs> OK. Partly free. OK. So most of us, we feel partly free. And I would agree. We're not completely free. We have, of course, again, a history. And that history does not compel, but it certainly informs our decisions. And as you get more conscious, of course, you have more room to make free choices. And the idea um, of free will in this notion of reality is that freedom does, in fact, evolve. So going to the microphysical again, all things, including, say, an electron or a photon or what have you, have some freedom, but it's pretty damn minimal. You know, so you look at quantum mechanics, for example, there are statistical laws. It's probability. So those 
kind of strange occurrences in various classes of the wave function or various outcomes refer to essentially choices, even at that very microphysical level, rather than pure chance. But statistically, it kind of evens out because they are, in fact, very rudimental, rudimentary uh, free beings. As matter complexifies, particularly in biological beings like ourselves, with four billion years of history right here in our bodies, if not more, then free will complexifies and expands. So freedom evolves in a very real way. <clears throat> and again, this kind of comes out of the idea of radial causation, because if we do subscribe to a notion of reductionist causation, then we are stuck with putting all the action at that basic level. Radial causation says, no, the action takes place at every level. And it's a, a co-creative process, an ongoing co-creative process. Sorry about that. So essentially here, go ahead. You used the word per, uh, perspection in the previous slide. Yeah, thank yeah, you. thank you for bringing it up. So essentially, um, diving a little bit deeper into the idea of free will. Um, my definition of free will is that we essentially can imagine possible futures, and then we can choose a preferred future. This is called prospection. Like problem solving, you have a whole bunch of alternatives, and then you select a preferred one. Exactly, yeah. So of course, in our lives, it's not too often we sit down and think, ah, oh, I could do this, this, this. Well, we, we should. We don't often. We just kind of do it instinctually, typically. But when we do sit down and think about what we really want to do for a big decision, we do think about the choices we have before us, and then we choose one. And again, modern physics says that's an illusion. You're not really choosing because what actually happened uh, was in fact determined literally 14 billion years ago in the Big Bang, which just sounds crazy to me, but that is the prevailing paradigm right now. So the idea of prospection is that we do in fact generate choices uh, in our minds, and of course, as our minds expand, become more complex from the level of an amoeba to human beings, then our free will expands. Um, so essentially, this is kind of the key to what free will means. That's the first part of getting to the solution. Go ahead. As far as free will, if we acknowledge that we are living in a living universe, and then we know the behavioral pattern of that, which is in a living and we create that website in our logic, then we are in sync with the living universe. And by thinking and acting, we place it back to us, so it will be a dynamic relationship that not only we are part of the whole thing, but at the same time, with our imagination and thinking, we are reflecting it back, and we are gaining the freedom at the same time to contain it. And our will and destiny will be sync because what we think is according to the thinking of the universe. I agree, and I'll just restate your, your comment. Um, you're saying essentially it's an ongoing dynamical process of sharing with the universe and then vice versa. And I agree entirely. So it's a co-creative process of unfolding creation. And this is what we are as human beings, but it's also what the electron is. It's helping out too. It's doing its thing. Any more questions on the very tricky notion of free will? Go ahead. What you're talking about essentially, do you want to keep on living in a very generalized sense? Yeah, That's, you know, what I'm saying is that we filter our own mm -hmm. aspects. We do. Yeah, it's a great question. So you're saying essentially, how do you actually, do you have the free will to, uh, to imagine your choices? Yeah, is it truly free or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so what I would say is that essentially we have, again, a lot of history behind us that informs our choices in a moment, which includes our prospection of possible futures. And the idea behind this, idea, this radial causation concept is that that process in each entity, whether, again, it's an electron, a human, a bat, a rat, a cat, what have you, is a combination of basically efficient causation 
which is, you know, in the moment, impact, and then final causation, which is essentially the other half of causation, where there is a creative unfolding. And this is kind of a brute fact in this system, but rather than the brute fact of Big Bang causation happening 14 billion years ago, it's an ongoing process in the present in each entity in this vast web of cause and effect. Do you see that as sort of the mind, mind matter? Because, you know, there's an aspect, the mind aspect is, is really Well, your question there is, is there a duality between mind and matter in this philosophy? And there is, an, there is an apparent duality, but it's not a true duality, because every entity, again, is both matter and mind in oscillating a perpetuity. So each entity is mind initially. It then manifests as matter based on its choices. And then it becomes mind-like again and becomes data for the next round of choices. So again, this oscillation process of time, what Whitehead calls a creative advance, is really key to this whole ontology. Mm -hmm. So I do want to stress here in wrapping up that in talking about these ideas, first of all, I have a very short time today. This is a two-hour talk, usually. Um, it's really hard and I think probably not productive to talk about these things in isolation. You need to talk about nature of mind and matter and cause and effect and time and free will all together, which makes it difficult because, of course, experience is unitary. It's not separate. These are all concepts and terms we use to kind of break down the totality of experience. But you have to try, and we start somewhere. We do our best with a short time. Um, I do want to also, well, first of all, a quick summary here. Um, essentially, mind is causal, not epiphenomenal. The universe is nothing but this vast web of cause and effect. Only the now is here. Only the now is real. And each cause, not just what we call, what we call matter typically, but each cause is both objective and subjective. It's objective for other entities outside of that cause. It's subjective for itself. So again, two sides of the same coin, inside, outside. And last, each cause is free to a degree, and as matter slash cause slash mind complexifies, so free will complexifies and expands. And I want to end this nice quote from uh, Whitehead, essentially highlighting the need for humility. Uh, his philosophy in the realm of ontology was what he called a speculative philosophy. And of course, a lot of this is speculation. There is no certainty here. And when we use concepts and terms and words, uh, it can feel like a game at times. But again, the key thing is to actually get to a point where you can actually explain satisfactorily to yourself the totality of your own experience. And when folks tell me I have no free will, I have a reaction to that. And so I think it's helpful to kind of go down this road to figure out, well, how do we resolve those issues? Some reading for you. And I'll wrap it up there. And uh, any final questions? You can pull back the reading. Sure. And I think you can download these after the fact, too. Any more questions? Go ahead. Um, yes, but it's, it's in each moment that that process unfolds. So literally in each moment, whether you look at the Planck moment or what have you, we don't know what the actual resolution of time is, of course. But the, the unfolding of time is an unfolding of that oscillation between mind and matter in each node of that web. Go ahead. Thank you.
that as a predatory report level cause that is causing that. So through that domination, we got this deterministic mind. And through that deterministic mind, eventually we got the, the linear perception and uh, uh, expectation and all of this. Yeah, so you're summarizing your point. Uh, you're saying that the deterministic paradigm tries to isolate um, definite causes, definite effects. And I would say that the alternative I've sketched today addresses that issue too, because in radial causation, it is literally a, a sphere of causal influence that goes out. And this accounts for everything conceptually. Identifying actual causes and effects, of course, is a very different problem. And then on the base of that uh, dominant one, we create this logic of judgment. And that shows the false step of judgment at the same time, too, that we are not considering the whole system is in, 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 in order to create an index. But we're just taking one major dominant one and causing it as a judgment on that. Normally, because of our I agree. And I've got to wrap there, so thank you very much.